and turning to the portion of scripture that we have before us this morning, uh, let me mention one other thing that was not uh, mentioned about what's in your bulletins. You will find there a, a little form which is a voter registration application. Now, we're not allowed, under what I think is erroneous law, to um, make comments on candidates for public office. Um, although there's some challenges that are coming down the road to that from the Alliance Defending Freedom, it used to be called the Alliance Defense Fund, but uh, in any case, if you're a Christian, you should be registered to vote. And if you are of voting age, and if you are not a criminal whose right to vote has been removed, please, we encourage you strongly to fill out that voter registration sheet that is in your bulletin today and send it in. The law certainly allows churches to uh, have voter registration drives. And dear friends, our country is very serious condition, in very serious condition. And uh, we need to have some Christians who are willing to step up to the plate and who are willing to take the little tiny bit of effort that it takes to go to the polls and to vote. Because otherwise, we are standing in line right now to lose our freedom as it has been lost in many other countries around the world by totalitarian government. So we encourage you to please uh, take that if you're not registered to vote, and please do register, and then on the day of the elections, please show up and vote. Now we read just a few moments ago that portion of text, which is a very key to the history of the nation of Israel, and also it's a very key text because it shows us how God deals with his people. When God makes a call, 
God always provides the enablement to fulfill that call. As we move into the New Testament and as we see the church beginning on the day of Pentecost and extending now for 2,000 years, we see that God made a very special provision for those whom he has called to be part of the body of Christ, the church. We find that on the day of Pentecost, God sent the Holy Spirit in a new and special way. Now, the Holy Spirit, of course, is God, and as God, he's one of the members of the Trinity, he is always omnipresent, and always has been omnipresent. Every member of the Trinity has that character quality. It is one of the immutable qualities of God. But the work that the Holy Spirit began on the day of Pentecost was a new work which had not been done before. It was prophesied in the book of Joel, in Joel chapter 2, concerning what the Holy Spirit would do on the day of Pentecost and the days following. And we've seen as we looked at that, that when God has called us, he has also gifted us with various spiritual gifts. There were originally 22 spiritual gifts. They are called by that technical term in the New Testament. Seven of those were temporary gifts. That is, they were given only during the apostolic period, during the time when the New Testament was being written. Once the New Testament was complete, those seven sign gifts were no longer given by the Holy Spirit. They are still counterfeited today by the world, the flesh, and the devil, but the Holy Spirit is no longer giving those seven gifts. The gifts of apostle, prophet, healings, miracles, tongues, interpretation of tongues, and the gift of knowledge, which related to the reception of new special revelation from God that he had never given before and which was inscripturated for us in the New Testament. Once the scripture were finished, all of the sign gifts which were to authenticate the message were removed by the Spirit of God. But we have today still 15 service gifts, gifts whereby believers are to minister one to another and to build up or to edify the body of Christ, as Paul explains in Ephesians chapter 4. And so last week we had gotten as far as the gift of teacher. We'd looked at evangelist already and the gift of pastor teacher. And we saw the gift of teacher, which supernaturally enables male believers who are walking in the spirit to explain and apply the word of God clearly and effectively to the church. We saw the gift of teacher is stated as a spiritual gift in Romans 12, 6, and 7. We saw that it was stated as a limited church leadership gift listed after apostle and prophet in 1 Corinthians 12, 28, and 29. And we saw that it was stated as a key element of the gift of pastor teacher. Last week we also looked at the gift of governments, which we saw was not the same as the gift of ruling. The gift of government enabled men with the gift of pastor teacher, and still does, with the gift of pastor teacher, evangelist, and teacher to give spiritual and temporal guidance to the church. We saw it was a very interesting word that was used here in 1 Corinthians 12, 28, where the gift of governments is listed. It's a rare word. It's the word kubernesis, and literally means to steer or to steer through. We saw that it was a nautical term used of the man, the helmsman, who steers a ship in the sea. And the noun form is twice used in the New Testament besides our occurrence in 1 Corinthians 12, 28, where we find Paul on board the ship sailing for Rome, and the centurion, eager to get to Rome, believes the master of the ship, and they cast off and head into a horrible storm. And then we saw it in Revelation 18:17, where every shipmaster and all the company and ships and sailors and as many as trade by sea stood afar off as they're worth watching the burning of Babylon. We saw the contrast with the gift of ruling. The gift of ruling enables all believers to stand as a spiritual example in his or her actions as an authority figure, as one giving aid, and as a servant to the church. We saw that as stated as a spiritual gift in Romans 12, 8. And the word prohistomy which translates that gift, means to stand before someone or something else. It's used in six different ways in the New Testament. It's used of someone standing to wait upon them, to serve them, like a servant would do. It's used of standing before someone to give them aid, and we saw the illustration of the Good Samaritan, where this word is used of the Good Samaritan. 
We saw it used of someone standing before someone else as a figure of authority, which is normally what we think of as ruling. But that's not the primary way in which it is used in the New Testament. We saw the fourth way is the way in which it is most often used in the New Testament, and that is to stand before someone as an example. That is its principal usage. So if you have the gift of ruling, it means that you are standing before someone, if you are in a position of authority, as an example for them to follow. And Peter uses it that way in 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 1 through 4. And we pointed out that this is an every believer gift because it is used of both men and women. It's required of men as the head of their own homes in 1 Timothy chapter 3. And it is required of women in the domain of the home as well in 1 Timothy chapter 5 where it is translated to guide the house. Then we looked at the definition of the gift of helps which enables every believer to strengthen weakened believers by bearing part of their workload. It's stated as a spiritual gift in 1 Corinthians 12, 28 as well. It's mentioned by Paul in his farewell speech to the Ephesian elders. Acts 20, 35, I have showed you all things, how that so laboring you ought to support the weak. And that word translated support there is the word for the gift of helps. And to remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. This is a primary gift that leadership should be using and exercising. He's addressing the Ephesian elders in Acts chapter 20. The elders should be laboring so that they could support, that is, give help to the weak. And to remember the words of the Lord Jesus Christ, that it is more blessed to give than to receive. We saw that it was connected to the gift of exhortation in 1 Timothy, excuse me, 1 Thessalonians 5.14. Now, we exhort you, brethren, and warn them that are unruly, comfort the feeble-minded, support, there's the word, our word for the gift of helps, support the weak, be patient to all men. And then when we spent most of our time last week was on the gift of faith, a very simple and short definition for it. The gift of faith enables every believer, it gives every believer the capacity to grow spiritually. It's stated as an every believer gift in Romans 12, 3 and through 6. It's stated as an expanding gift related to spiritual growth, and it is stated as a gift necessary for the function of other spiritual gifts. If you are not walking by faith, you cannot exercise any other spiritual gift that you have. Romans 12.3 says, For I say, through the grace given unto me, to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, and this is the key issue, where we see that this is an every believer gift, according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. We noted the definition that I had written last week. Faith is complete confidence in the word of God. Saving faith is created in the elect by what the sovereign God reveals himself to be. You have no faith in something unless you can somehow check out its reliability. And God has revealed himself to us as one who is always faithful. We see that consistently throughout the scriptures. And so it is externally what God has revealed himself to be, which gives us faith internally. We don't work it up internally first and apply it outside. You'll find if you do that that you'll often be disappointed. It is because God has revealed himself to us and has always proved himself to be reliable that produces faith in us. We saw the description of faith in Hebrews 11.1. 1. You're all familiar with that. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen, followed by the examples of faith, the heroes of faith there in Hebrews 11. And in every case, that definition of confidence in the word of God goes back to what the heroes of faith did. They heard the word of God, they received the word of God, they believed it, and they acted upon it. Genuine faith is not theoretical. Genuine faith always responds by acting in obedience to the word of God. Faith is when we believe the God, word of God no matter what the subject matter is. We saw that faith is used five ways in the Bible. Saving faith, sanctifying faith, the gift of faith, faith as the fruit of the Spirit, and the faith, with the definite article in front of it, the faith, which refers to that body of once revealed truth given to the apostles and prophets by the Spirit of God and written down to us in the Scripture. All of those, got, all of those go back to God revealing himself and thus creating faith in us. 
And that's what brought us to the gift that we want to start with today, because we saw faith was connected to wisdom in James chapter 1, verses 2 through 8. And I'll read that portion now. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have her perfect work, that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, that giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. In other words, when you fall into those trials which are testing your faith, you can ask God for wisdom so that you know how to deal with the trial. But verse 6 is the key verse. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord, a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Verse 8. We saw that faith is very closely connected to wisdom. But if you want wisdom, you have to ask in faith. The Christian life is based on faith. We're saved by faith. We walk by faith. If we're not walking by faith, we are walking in the flesh and certainly not pleasing to God. So when do we know when we're walking by faith and when we're not walking by faith? How do we deal with those tough situations of life where we don't know quite which way to go, where we want to do God's will, but we're not quite sure what God's will is? You know, you've heard all those situational ethics things, especially if you've been to college. In your freshman year of college, you will be challenged in some class with some point of situational ethics where you don't quite know what the answer is. Years ago, when I was in college, I got challenged that way in one of my classes. They presented us various hypothetical situations. Here's a little boy by the name of Johnny, and Johnny's mother is um, starving to death. Johnny doesn't have a dad. His mother is lying home sick, and um, so uh, Johnny is going down to the grocery store, and as he walks past, he sees a, a loaf of bread there, and his mother is starving, and um, they have no money. And there's no father in the picture. And um, so now, what is the loving thing for Johnny to do? And if it's the loving thing, it must be the right thing to do. And the grocer is not looking. And Johnny knows he can get away with it. So the right thing, right, is to steal the loaf of bread and go home and give your mother some food because she's dying. That's the situational ethics situation. And they only give you the two options. Either you let your mother starve to death, or you have to steal. But folks, in the real world, it's not like that. Johnny has many other options as well. There are friends, there are neighbors, there are social service uh, organizations in the community. If Johnny is part of a church, there are people in the church who will help him, as they should. You see, the world doesn't want you to know about other options. The gift of wisdom, which is connected to the gift of faith, is what we're moving into at this time. And it's such an important gift that I'm going to spend some extended time on it as I did on the gift of faith. And by the way, wisdom is not the same thing as knowledge. Knowledge is the accumulation of facts. Wisdom is the ability to apply factual data to real life. Human wisdom applies human knowledge to life. Divine wisdom applies divine knowledge, which is the scripture, as well as human knowledge to life. It extends far beyond human wisdom, as we'll see in many of the verses that we'll be looking at the Lord willing this morning. So here's the definition. The gift of wisdom gives every believer the capacity to understand and apply the word of God. It is a gift that expands through the illuminating work of the Holy Spirit as the believer studies and applies the Word of God. The believer is commanded to ask God for wisdom in applying the Word of God. And the gift of wisdom is always linked to faith. Proverbs says that the principal thing is wisdom. So it's no surprise that God has given it as a spiritual gift. Proverbs 4, 7. Wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom. And with all thy getting, get understanding. Proverbs 4, 7. That's one of the two most important foundational every believer gifts. Therefore, 
if you want to grow spiritually and please Christ, you should be focusing on exercising and developing the gift of wisdom. No other most important foundational gift, of course, we just talked about, which is the gift of faith. You cannot do anything profitable in the Christian life. Listen, you cannot do anything profitable in the Christian life without those two gifts, faith and wisdom. Think about it for a moment. Can you think of anything that you can do that is spiritually profitable and to the glory of God without faith and without wisdom? Without faith, it is impossible to please him. Without wisdom, you are classified as a fool. Faith and wisdom are the two foundational gifts for the exercise of all the other spiritual gifts. God has given us a massive amount of wisdom literature in Scripture. The following books, Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Lamentations, and James. Those are the principal wisdom books, and they say so within themselves, but they are wisdom books. So if you want to grow in wisdom, start studying those books. So now we move into the gift of wisdom. Wisdom is stated as a spiritual gift in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 7 and 8. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all, that is, to profit everyone. For by one is given to the Spirit the word of wisdom, to the another the word of knowledge by the same Spirit. So there it is in the context of the spiritual gifts. 1 Corinthians 12 through 14 deal with the spiritual gifts. Chapter 13, which we consider the love chapter, is actually dealing with the spiritual gifts as contrasted with Christ-like character. And we find out at the end of chapter 13 that God would, in fact, terminate certain of the spiritual gifts when the scriptures were fulfilled, verses 8 and following of 1 Corinthians 13. Wisdom is stated as a gift that grows with exercise and practice so that we can apply it in different times of trouble. And that's that portion of text that we read a moment ago in James chapter 1, where we can ask God for wisdom. We can ask him and God will not ball us out for asking for it. It says, If any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally, and abradeth not, and it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith. You see, if you don't ask in faith for wisdom, you won't get anything else either. You know, that's what the text says there. Let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally, and abradeth not, and it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith nothing wavering, for he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind, and tossed. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. The double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Do you understand those two keys for getting answers to prayer? The gift of faith and the gift of wisdom. If you're not walking by faith, how can you ask prayers of God and expect a yes answer? But if you don't have wisdom which he says you can ask for here, you won't know what to ask for. James says you ask and receive not because you ask amiss that you may consume it upon your own lust, you adulterers and adulteresses. What, know ye not that friendship with the world is enmity with God? You see, if you're not walking by faith, you can't ask for wisdom and get it because you're a double-minded man. You'll flop back and forth. But if you ask in faith, you will get wisdom, which will enable you not only to deal with the temptations and the trials that he has just spoken about, but it will also enable you to bear the fruit of the Spirit, as he explains later at the end of the chapter, and it will also keep you from being called a spiritual adulterer, one who wants prayer requests from God so that you can consume it upon your own lusts. These are essential gifts, people, and God has given them to you. But many people never exercise their gifts. Many people never see those gifts grow. Many people never see any positive answers to their prayer requests because they're walking in the flesh and they're not walking by faith. They're not walking in the Spirit. You can't exercise a spiritual gift unless you're walking in the Spirit, which is walking by faith. Two gifts. I know I'm trying to be I'm trying to be very simple about this. There's an incredible amount of wonderful information, but two gifts. You you have them. You don't question that you have them. The text says you do. 
The question is, are you exercising them? Are you walking by faith? Are you walking in wisdom, redeeming the time because the days are evil? God has given you the ability. If he gives you a call, he will enable you to fulfill the call. Wisdom and faith. And if you don't ask for wisdom in faith, you won't get wisdom and you won't get anything else. James says so here in James chapter 1. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. What is supposed to dwell in you richly in all wisdom? The word of Christ. Your only source for wisdom, God works with content. He doesn't work in a vacuum. The only source for wisdom is as you study scripture, as you look at your problem, and as you ask God, and then God gives you understanding of the scripture so that you will know how to apply it on the horizontal level in real life. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. We find wisdom is stated as a gift for growing in the knowledge of the will of God. Do you want to know the will of God? Well, you ask for wisdom. Remember, to get wisdom, you have to ask in faith, nothing wavering. For he that wavereth is as a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. So if you want to know the will of God, wisdom is necessary. Colossians 1.9 For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to desire that you might be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Did you get that? The knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Do you want to know the will of God? And I trust that you do. If you want to know the will of God, you must have wisdom and spiritual understanding. But to get that, you must ask for it in faith. That is, you must be walking by faith. Otherwise, how can you know and do the will of God? If you're walking in the flesh, if you're walking carnally, you will not do the will of God. We find that wisdom, its active use and its fullness is required in church leadership. Acts chapter 6 verse 3. We find the initial choice of deacons in the early church. The church had grown massively by this time. It was too much work to keep up with all the daily routine of the church, all the technical issues. And so uh, Peter and the other apostles wanted to give themselves fully to the study of the Word of God and to prayer. That's what your pastor ought to be doing, too. We need to have folks here who step up to the plate and take care of other things. But here we find that the solution was to appoint seven men who had certain character qualities. Reliable Christian men. Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. They were men who had to be filled with the Spirit of God, which has nothing to do with speaking in tongues, which has nothing to do with the charismatic movement. Being filled with the Spirit of God means being under the control of the Holy Spirit. He is a Holy Spirit. These were holy men. They were men who were living separated, sanctified lives. They were filled with the Holy Spirit. That is, he controlled their thoughts. He controlled their tongues. He controlled their actions. He controlled their motives. He controlled their perspective on life, what we call a Christian worldview. Being filled with the Spirit means being controlled by the Spirit in everything that you do 24 hours a day. Either you are filled with the Spirit or you are not filled with the Spirit. Now, some of us float in and out of that. In fact, all of us do it sometime or another. 
Being filled with the Spirit is being controlled by the Spirit in your daily walk. The men who were appointed over this task were full of the Holy Ghost and they were full of wisdom. Would you expect anything else? If they're filled with the Holy Spirit, they're going to be filled with wisdom. They will be able to take divine knowledge and apply it to real life situations. It's required of church leadership. Divine wisdom is irresistible when it is proclaimed. Acts 6.10 Speaking of those who opposed Stephen, it says they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spake. It was irresistible and it was irrefutable wisdom. You know, when we use wisdom of the world, which is primarily in the area of logic and reason, although some people's wisdom is totally illogical and unrational, and they think it's wisdom, scripture calls it a foolish wisdom, and we'll see those passages in a bit. But when you are speaking with divine wisdom, the only thing that your opponent can do with you is either run away or shut you up. And here they shut Stephen up permanently. They killed him. Divine wisdom is irresistible. It is irrefutable. Divine wisdom is not the same thing as human wisdom. Paul says so in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 19 and following. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and I will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. For the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. And we've already talked about the Jews requiring a sign as we've gone through the book of Acts and the evening messages. Always looking for a sign. An evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign. Tells you much about the charismatic movement today. And the Greeks seek after wisdom. Oh, we have all these secular universities around us. The halls of wisdom. Human wisdom. That never reaches God. And that's what Paul is contrasting here. For the Jews require a sign and the Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified. Under the Jews a stumbling block. And under the Greeks foolishness. But unto us which are called. Remember we talked about being called. If God calls you, he's going to empower you. If God calls you, he's going to direct you. If God calls you, he will lead you in your life. As long as you're walking by faith. And as long as you're asking him for wisdom. Which comes from the word of God. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For you see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty, and base things of the world, and things which are despised hath God chosen. Yea, and things which are not to bring to naught things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. Stopping there for just a moment, there are two more verses yet. If you're here this morning and if you're saved, understand that you and I both fit that category. God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. God has chosen base things. God has chosen weak things. God has chosen despised things. And God has chosen the things that are not. Because you see, then it proves that he is the great God, not that we are the great people. He is the great God who can take an instrument like we are and take us and use us for the spread of the gospel of Christ around the world and for the confounding of the arrogant, proud people of this world. My wife and I were driving through Collingswood yesterday and the thought just struck me as I saw various people out on the sidewalks and hanging out in their cool outfits and doing their thing. 
and laughing and drinking. And I said to her, you know, this is certainly a town that thinks highly of itself. But its moral condition puts it at the bottom of the barrel as far as God is concerned. The wisdom of the world, the wise of the world, the people who think they are something when God says they are nothing. How sad, and yet that is where God has put us so that we might be a light in this place and to reach these people with the gospel of Christ, the only one who can save them. Last two verses, but of him are you in Christ Jesus, who of God, now listen to this, is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption but according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. You and I have nothing to glory about except in Christ. We started out as the base things, the dishonorable things of the world. The world scorned and looked down at the refuse which we were at one point. And God in his mercy saved us. So that we would not glory in ourselves, but glory only in Christ. That is wisdom. Christ is made unto us wisdom. That kind of wisdom is not comprehensible by an unsaved man or a well-learned man. 1 Corinthians 2, beginning in verse 1, And I, brethren, when I came unto you, came not with excellency of speech or wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. Not the wisdom of the world, but Christ. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. If you don't think those are good things for you to be, look at Paul. He admits it. My speech and preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power. You know, it goes back to Paul didn't have a natural gift of teacher, but God gave him the spiritual gift of teacher. We saw that contrast before between pagans who have natural abilities in communication and the spiritual gift of teaching. It's not the same thing. That your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Howbeit we speak wisdom among them that are perfect, that's teleos, those who are spiritually mature. Yet not the wisdom of this world, nor of the princes of this world that come to naught, but we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery. And you know there are 17 different mysteries listed in the New Testament. Those are things which were not revealed in the Old Testament, but which were revealed after the day of Pentecost in the New Testament to the apostles and prophets. The Apostle Paul says so in Ephesians chapter 3. We speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory, which none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Natural wisdom cannot ascend to divine wisdom. Divine wisdom is revelatory and illuminatory. That is, God gave it, whereas it was never known before, and God gives us understanding. That's what illumination is about. He helps us understand the scriptures that are written. He's not giving new revelation, but he helps us understand by the Spirit of God, the Word of God, so that we will have wisdom. So that we will be able to see the world in which we live from God's perspective. That is the Christian worldview. And it is essential if you are walking by faith to have wisdom for you will face opposition and you will not know how to answer the opposition unless you have the wisdom of God. The restriction on divine wisdom is perhaps best stated in the book of Proverbs in chapter 17. Wherefore is there a price in the hand of a fool to get wisdom, seeing he hath no heart to it? The unbeliever does not have a heart for wisdom, God's wisdom. He has a heart for human wisdom. He has a heart for demonic wisdom. We'll see that James talks about that. But he has no heart for divine wisdom. Wisdom is given to the saved by the Holy Spirit. Now we have received, this is 1 Corinthians chapter 2 beginning in verse 12, not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. You can't know them any other way. 
Which things also we speak not in the words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Ghost teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. Are you beginning to get the idea that wisdom is a key topic in the Bible? When was the last time you thought about wisdom? When was the last time as you were reading through your devotions, you stopped and thought, wisdom, that's the principal thing. I've got to get wisdom, and with all my getting, I've got to get understanding. Wisdom is one of the principal topics of Scripture. We all like to talk about faith. It's heart of the Reformation. But we need wisdom as we walk by faith in this world to know how to apply God's Word to the circumstances and the situations in which we find ourselves. Which things we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Ghost teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. Now listen, Paul's going to talk about three kinds of people. He's going to talk about the natural man, the spiritual man, and the carnal man. The natural man is the unsaved man. The spiritual man is the saved man. The carnal man is a man who is saved, but he's walking in the flesh. But the natural man, that is the unsaved man, receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, Listen to this. Neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. An unsaved man, the natural man, cannot have divine wisdom. He can accumulate facts. You know, anybody can memorize verses of Scripture. But unless a person is born again... He cannot understand the proper application of the scripture, which is what relates to divine wisdom. The natural man receives not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. But he that is spiritual, that is the saved man who is walking by faith, he that is spiritual judgeth all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. For who hath known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? Now listen, but we have the mind of Christ. He's writing to those who are spiritual. They see things the way that Jesus sees them. Having the mind of Christ does not mean a brain transplant. What it means is he's been talking about wisdom and discerning things and understanding how the world around us is not in harmony with the word of God and being able to stand up against it when we walk by faith and wisdom to know how to walk through it. We have the mind of Christ to give us the wisdom by the Spirit of God so that we will be able to deport ourselves in the same way that Jesus deported himself while he was here on earth. And as you look at his earthly ministry described for us in detail in the Gospels, you will see the mind of Christ. How he walked how he answered his opponents, how he taught his disciples. Oh, wisdom. How important wisdom is. For many, many years, probably 40 years, 50 years now, I've read the book of Proverbs every day. I know I've missed a couple of days in there, but consistently read the book of Proverbs every day. A chapter a day. Chapter 1 on the first day of the month. Chapter 2 on the second day of the month. And I also go through and read the book of Ecclesiastes quite frequently, about once every third time through the book of Proverbs. There's an incredible amount of wisdom there, people, on how we're supposed to live. Now, I don't always do it. Sometimes I know what I ought to do, and I have the wisdom of the Scripture to do it, and then I fail to do it. We are disobedient on occasion. In fact, on many occasions, if we're honest about it. But God has provided wisdom... And he has given you that gift so that you can read his word, ask him for wisdom, and as you ask in faith, he will give you wisdom as to how to interact with the world around you from the divine perspective, the Christian worldview. I don't know how many ways I can say that. Wisdom is given to the saved. Carnal Christians will not exercise the gift of wisdom, and therefore they will not be wise. Some of you are carnal. You're saved, you're on your way to heaven, but you're carnal. You're still acting like babies. You're still walking in the flesh. And Paul describes that in detail. There were people like that at Corinth. There were people like that at Rome. There were people like that in the churches of Galatia. Uh, doesn't matter which church you look at in the New Testament. You've got spiritual Christians and you've got carnal Christians. And so that's true for us here. If you are a carnal Christian, that is if you are walking in the flesh and not walking in the spirit habitually, you will not have wisdom. 
And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. I have fed you with milk and not with meat. For hitherto you were not yet able to bear it, neither yet now are you able. For you are carnal, for whereas there is among you envying and strife and divisions, are you not carnal and walk as men? He's just finished discussing the spiritual man who walks in wisdom and who walks in the spirit. He's discussed the natural man who is incapable of receiving divine wisdom and has no understanding of the things of God. And now he moves to the carnal man in the very next verse as we begin chapter 2. Three kinds of people. The natural man, the spiritual man, the carnal man. Where do you fall this morning? You are in one of those three categories. You can't get out of it. You are in one of those three categories. Either you are unsaved, or you are what's called the spiritual man, one who is walking by faith in the power of the Spirit and asking for wisdom, or you are a carnal man. You're saved, you're like a newborn baby, but should you spend your entire life in a crib fussing and whining and having somebody else change your diapers? That's the carnal Christian. They stay in the stage of infancy many times for years and years and years and years, and they never grow. I've seen some situations like that, where physically a child is born and has some defect and is not able to physically mature. And so they get to be 20, 30, 40 years old and still have to have someone care for them in the same way that you would care for an infant. And Paul uses that as an illustration to express what is sadly true about many churches, and I believe here in the United States especially, where we don't have persecution, where we don't have a challenge to our faith, in any real way that's a significant way, we have social pressure. You know, we have people who scorn us. Maybe we can lose a job over it. But nothing like Christians in other parts of the world where they have to hide out in, in caves to be able to worship God. Wisdom. Oh, how essential it is to the Christian life. In fact, we find that divine wisdom is the key to living the Christian life. Second Corinthians 1.12 For our rejoicing is this, the testimony of our conscience, that in simplicity and godly sincerity, not with fleshly wisdom, but by the grace of God, now listen to this next phrase, we have had our conversation in the world and more abundantly to you word. Not with fleshly wisdom, but with divine wisdom, we've had our manner of life, that's what the word conversation means, our manner of life in the world. People on the outside see that is different with us. But it's not only Paul expressing wisdom so that outsiders saw it, but he said in the last phrase, and more abundantly to you word, you really begin to understand what wisdom is all about. You believers there at Corinth. Divine wisdom is the key to living the Christian life, not worldly wisdom. Listen to James, James 3.13. Who is a wise man endued with knowledge among you? Let him show out of a good conversation his works with meekness of wisdom. Let him show out of his good manner of life the works that he is doing. They prove his wisdom and he does them with meekness. Meekness is not weakness. Meekness is strength under control. And we'll talk about that more when we get to the gift of self-control. Well, I can see our time is up. I wish we had time for this, but um, wisdom is gained from the Word, and the results are teaching sound doctrine and godly music. But I want to spend some time on that, so the Lord willing, we'll pick that up next week. Our gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you so much for your Word and for its power. Your word is the foundation upon which we stand and upon which all the gifts are based. Your Holy Spirit is the empowerment upon which we rely, and no spiritual gift can be exercised apart from the work of the Spirit. You have given to each one of us the gift of faith, and you expect us to walk by faith. There is no Christian who is not expected to walk by faith. There is no Christian who has not been given faith. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. 
And Father, you've told us to walk by faith even when there is a situation of temptation or trial, as James tells us. And Father, we pray that as we face those trials and don't know the answers, that we will study your word, that we will let the word of Christ dwell in us richly in all wisdom, and that we will ask you for wisdom, for understanding and application of the scriptures so that we might walk in wisdom toward them that are without redeeming the time. Father, help us to walk by faith. Help us to ask for wisdom and faith. And as we see you giving us wisdom, then we know we can ask for other things, for we will not ask amiss that we can consume it upon our lusts. We will ask for wisdom, and then the things that we ask for will be in harmony with your word and with your will. Thank you, Father, for this your word. We pray that you will take it as it has been preached in simplicity, open our eyes, give us understanding, and help us to apply it so that we might walk in wisdom this day. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.